on about the programs that the police department has, but it, they're all geared towards interaction, personal interaction between the community and law enforcement. Okay. Major P Peterson. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> we have to build trust. The public, in order for us to do our job, we have to have trust. The public has to trust us enough to believe that we're doing the right thing. Will we make mistakes? Yes. And when we make those mistakes, just like the colonel said and others, we have to own up to them. And the more the public see that we do own up to our mistakes and try to correct them, the more that they believe in us. We in the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office, we have programs where we get out, like Ms. Dr. Brooks, we'll get out with the backpack and work with him and, and the kids. We get out in the public and communicate with them the things that we do in the Sheriff's Office, but we also invite them into the Sheriff's Office. We have a program whereby we have a Citizens Academy where the public can come in and it runs for uh, about six nights and they can see exactly what we do on a daily basis. We, we have ride-along programs where people can ride along with the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office to see what we do. Our community police unit. The entire agency is a community police unit. We believe in getting out in the public. One of the worst things we can do is close ourselves off from the public by sitting in that car day in and day out and not engaging the public. So I require the people to get out. The sheriff required the deputies to get out, talk with the public, communicate with them. And these things are logged in so that we know that they're being done. And that's one of the ways that we try to build trust with the community and their trust in us. Thank you. Thank you. This next question, I'm going to turn to Dr. Davis. If you will, tell us what role the college and college students can play in affecting positive change in the interactions between law enforcement and the community. Okay, thank you. We've talked about quite a bit this morning, and I've heard the panel panelists mention a number of things that um, – are important to developing those relationships and as far as the role that higher ed or, and or students can play with producing pos positive change. Um, there are several key things that um, I heard and transparency was is one and I'm sure we will continue to talk about transparency. The community has talked about transparency, um, but transparency to those uh, that would avail the students with information, um, the college or institutions with information to develop strategies. Transparency as far as information, what is happening, not only transparency but empathy. Um, specifically, how can the college play? But we're producing citizens. And when we look at the history of our students, even if you go back, students have been the forefront of change for many years. Even if we look back at the Greensboro Four, SNCs with John Lewis, um, our students serve as ambassadors and we are preparing our students to be change agents in the community. We are preparing our students to be civically engaged. Our students are the, in preparing our students to be civically engaged, these students not only are service the ambassadors, but these students can carry back um, information or be that li liaison to their peers and to their families. Not only can we foster um, these students to become ambassadors and change agents, but developing partnerships with law enforcement agencies or with law enforcement through internships. Uh, not only through internships, I, I heard uh, mention of an internship possibility or opportunity for students, even in regards to this particular issue. Not only internships, but jobs. 
um, providing jobs, um, making um, the seat available for students to, our students to be at the table to discuss these issues. Uh, not only that, but being the liaison as far as the university with partnerships, even with open houses where we may develop a, um, uh, programs where um, law enforcement have open houses for our students, um, not only our students, but faculty. Uh, there are a number of things that um, are roles that we can serve as a university that will help improve the relationship or have, be impactful. Uh, one thing that I also wanted to mention is that I heard, I heard about, I heard um, Reverend Rowden mention conversation. And the community, a lot of times, are tired of hearing about conversation because they want to see action, and not only action, but after implementation. They want to be heard. And when we talk about conversation or dialogue, I would say this morning we're having conversation. But we would like to foster something beyond conversation, and that is deliberate dialogue. And with deliberate dialogue, those are steps. That's acknowledging who we are, being empathetic to the population that's most impacted. Not only being emp empathetic, but I mentioned earlier, transparent. So with that being said, uh, not only deliberate dialogue beyond this conversation, but actually seeing action in implementation and using some of the expertise, not only from our students or us facilitating our students' learning, but from experts in the field, providing evidence-based um, information, data, research that help impact policy and programs. Okay, thank you. Mr. Brooks, you mentioned that your passion is young people. So how do you help foster that community partnership I think when it comes to young people, the answer is fairly simple. And I'm a simple-minded person. Obviously, I don't have any degrees of my um, constituents here on this panel, and um, but I do have a degree in um, how people think and how people operate. Um, we need to get extremely younger. Um, we need to go ahead and start talking to children as young as second grade and third grade, not just about law enforcement and what law enforcement does, but in specific duties of the community and how that translates over to what we think should come before, come after that. Whether it's, if you do this, does that, should that involve law enforcement? What kind of punishment does that look like? It doesn't always have to involve somebody in a uniform. Um, when it comes to students, I think internships, like um, Dr. Davis mentioned, kids don't know about careers in law enforcement. Most of the times they know about policing, the, the act of policing, they don't know about that. But I think it should be widespread and I also think we should be careful about keeping this thing, looking at one community over the other. Oftentimes we talk about the black and brown communities, but there's another community that most of us know somebody that exists in, and it has nothing to do with color. It's socioeconomically deprived. It's the, it's the poor people, the people that don't have a lot of money, don't have an idea, because they don't have money, what career opportunities present themselves. I don't know if it takes a college degree to be a police officer. I don't know if it takes a college degree to become a dispatch officer. I don't know any of those things, but those are ways that we can do it. Look at what children are doing now. What are their biggest interests? Their interests are video games, YouTube, computers, laptops, and cell phones. And those are the same, that's the same equipment that's used in law enforcement. I don't think kids understand it if they walk into a control room at a police department that they'll see all these lights and buzzes and it may spark some sort of interest to them. So um, talking to them about the technological ways they can be involved through their video games, through the STEM program, through biology, they can connect with law enforcement. There's a crime lab. So there's plenty of ways that we can introduce children into the law enforcement career without looking at it from a standpoint of policing. So therefore it becomes a balance. Um, I'm a barber by trade and I deal with people, but when I'm not barbering, I'm dealing with people about the conversations that I have as a barber. So the uniqueness, again, about me is that I get to see the whole gamut of it all. And then I have to go and get in my car and all of a sudden I'm a black man and I'm driving down the street and witnessing the same thing, the same apprehension. Um, Pastor Rodden mentioned fear. You know, I think there's a problem 
if a child fears law enforcement. I think it's a huge problem if they do that, but I think it's an even bigger problem if they have a dismissal when they see law enforcement. Okay. Can, can I? Yes, sir. Um, one of the things I've experienced, uh, even in this community, when we talk about young people and what law enforcement is doing to try to engage and try to really protect our uh, youth in a traffic stop, for example. And I can remember when there were videos and things out about what you shouldn't do, you know, stay in the vehicle, don't jump out of the vehicle, be polite and these things. But it's up to us as well to teach our young people as well that these are things we should do. And the reason why I say this one intervene because I could I would hear some that say, oh, that's just another way that they want to control us. No, that's a way to keep you and the officer safe. So it goes both ways. And as a, a faith-based leader, it's my responsibility to talk to my young parishioners and young people in the community that know this is not to control you, it's to help you. So these are the kind of things that we have to tweak maybe in law enforcement say, well, maybe we can present it another way because presentation is everything, especially for, for young folk and the parent as well. The parent plays an important role. To, to, to encourage children. I, I hear it more so now, you know, from celebrities even saying, well, I have children that I'm afraid when they go out, these things happen, and I tell them, make sure you do A, B, C, and D. And they're the exact things that right here in our community we try to say to young people or to anyone, these are the things that will help, not that anyone's trying to control you. I wanted to add that. Okay. Yes. We believe in reaching the public through the young folk. We go out and do um, career days in the various elementary schools, middle schools, and even high schools. And we come out to the colleges as well to mentor to the young folk so that they don't see us all the time in a law enforcement role. Yes, we have on a uniform, but we're people as well. And the young folk, if we get them to respect us, they will grow up that way. But they also go back and talk to their parents and tell their parents their interactions with us in the school that day, and it grows from there. Sir. The next question I'll give to Director Shermeyer. What are you doing to recruit a diverse workforce in the SBI? We've uh, come up with a diversity and inclusion plan that begins with an internship program uh, to engage historically black colleges and universities throughout the state. Um, we're uh, also encouraging and developing a plan to uh, provide leadership training for uh, the agents within uh, within the SBI. So uh, women and minorities are going to be uh, uh, promoted and um, given additional training. And, um, and we found within the SBI that the uh, internship program is a great way for us to recruit and uh, ultimately promote um, uh, a diverse workforce. So we've got a plan in place. It's got five objectives to it, but the internship program and leadership training and mentorship are two of the pivotal things. Okay. Chief Kelly. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so I'm just have real talk for, for about two minutes. I think I, the time limit is, is, and Mr. Brooks and I have an advantage over everybody else because we talk every Thursday at one o'clock about this topic or these topics, but we talk about diversity. And I, I, I'll, I'll bet you $100 to a donut, Colonel McNeil will agree. We want good quality people who have empathy, who care about people, and who will do the right thing. You know, so we get caught up when, you know, of course you want to have a, a law enforcement agency that depicts its community. But I'd rather have good people with good hearts and good intentions that will do the right thing that will represent Colonel McNeil, Major Peterson, or myself, or law enforcement as a whole throughout this city, county, state, and nation, so where we don't pay the price 
for one bad apple. We get caught up on being, you know, diverse, but we want to be diverse in the fact that we have good people with good intentions and doing the right thing. You know, we, we go out to the colleges and universities, but you're fighting a, a perception of law enforcement um, that we've never seen before. And to, to go out and my, recruit minorities is extremely difficult. But Mr. Brooks says that at the beginning is that a kid has to understand that it's an option. You know, the federal fire department had an issue with diversity some years ago. And I stood up trying to help the fire chief out because he was getting beat up pretty bad about his, his lack of diversity. But I never knew an option to be a fireman. Didn't want to, but didn't know I didn't want to because no, ever, no one ever showed me that option to be a fireman. So I think we introduced, we're, we're desperate right now in law enforcement um, to have uh, good quality women and men in this profession. And so right now we just want good people. Colonel McNeil, do you have anything to add? Yes, ma'am. I hate to go back to leadership, but again, it, it starts with your leadership. And for me, uh, Mr. Secretary, he holds me accountable for making sure that we have a plan in place for underutilized populations. And um, to your point, and ma'am, to your point, the North Carolina State Highway Patrol, we're hiring. The Department of Public Safety, we are hiring. So there's not a profession that exists here in North Carolina that in DPS, we don't have a job to be able to put people in and to, to put them to work. But re recruiting is extremely, extremely important to me. But you also have to know and understand your history. For the North Carolina State Highway Patrol, we began in 1929 in the first 40 plus years of existence didn't include people that look like me. And so we have had our work cut out for us since day one being a minority working within the State Highway Patrol. But it goes to your leadership. You know, what you as leaders make be a priority is what your folks will work towards. Our director of training is responsible for our recruiting efforts. We have a minority recruitment plan. We have minority recruiters spread throughout the organization. Every job fair, we have a high school internship program. We have a college internship program, and we're trying to be in schools just as often as we can be. You know, with the pandemic, it has impacted how we're able to be in schools with the school closures. We do something called school safety checks. They're very simple. Our state troopers, we just want them to show up in any school, check out and walk around and just be seen and to build relationships. Last year under Major Conley, who's here and present with me now, under his leadership, we performed more than 19,000 of these school safety checks last year. Each one of those checks, me included, I did several myself, they were numerous opportunities for us to introduce ourselves to the public and to build relationships. I am a North Carolina state trooper because as a child I met a state trooper. And that interaction was positive and it was favorable for me. And we have numerous state troopers that have joined our organization because of a favorable and positive interaction that they had with a state trooper as a young adult. Thank you. Well, we've been talking about recruitment and recruiting a diverse workforce. Major Peterson, I'm going to ask you this question. How has the unrest that's been happening across the country impacted recruiting? Thank you, ma'am. It has impacted recruiting, but it has ebbs and flows, meaning it's like when 9-11 kicked off. You had a lot of people running to the military, wanting to help this country. Well, in recruiting, since everything has occurred with the shootings and whatnot, George Floyd, um, we have our highs and our lows. It, it does impact it. But our recruiters get out and, and, and try to show a positive aspect of law enforcement, especially minorities. But it's, it's sometimes difficult because of the image that people have of law enforcement. But we are still able to get good qualified people 
and we have plenty of jobs for them. Yes, sir. I was talking to one of my youth uh, at our church. Uh, he's 16 years old, and we were talking about possibilities when he graduate from school. And we were talking about different professions. And I mentioned to him, I said, what about law enforcement? He said, oh, no. You know, and it's because of the climate. And I began to tell him a lot of the things that law enforcement involves. And what he said, I didn't know they did that. All he see is what's in the news or what's going on in the community. So, yes, uh, uh, it does impact recruiting. But that goes back to what we talked about, partnership. Me as a faith leader, what role do I play to do just that, to let people know, no, it's not that bad. There's better in, in your life. Uh, Colonel mentioned he had a great experience uh, with Highway Patrol. As a youth, I had a great experience with the law enforcement that come by and just talk to me. But now kids, will, you know, say, well, they're not coming by asking me how was my day. They're coming by asking me why am I standing out here. So, again, I'm glad we're having these conversations. But what do we do when we leave the room? How do we have an impact on our youth? Okay. Yes. One of the things, and, and Dr. You said the same thing, you know, again, I'm going to go back to leadership. Mr. Secretary is here because he is passionate about this committee that he's assigned to on this task force. The recommendations that conversations such as this that take place, this is not the only conversations that are being had. They've had numerous virtual town hall meetings, and he's put it into place recommendations that come from meetings such as this. So you know, I'm glad we're having the conversations. Please, if you got recommendations to make things better, he's here, he's present, and he welcomes those things. But can I go back to one of your points? You know, we're hiring, and we want to have people to, from various communities to come and be a part of the state patrol. We cannot be better if we are not a diverse and inclusive organization. So as you interact with young folks, please let them know. Stay Highway Patrol. We are hiring, and we want to put people to work. But I he was the colonel, not the recruiter. He's the <laughs> recruiter today. Hey, all state troopers are always recruiters. But I also mentioned to, to you, do you know we have a doctor that works on the Highway Patrol or doctors? Do you know we have nurses? Do you know we have uh, mechanics? We have pilots. We have numerous. Like I said, there's not a profession in our Department of Public Safety that we don't have. We have engineers. And so young folks, you know, uh, the sky is the limit. It's just not police work wearing a uniform going in and, and, and to arrest folks. We have multifaceted. Uh, Mr. Director has labs and all kinds of technicians, bomb technicians, canines. The, the sky is the limit. Uh, uh, pilots. You know, so we're, we're very diverse in the, the number of and the types of jobs that we have available to our public. And this forum gives us an opportunity to showcase them. Mr. Brooks said we also have lots of information technology people too, um, people that do social media. So um, all kinds of opportunities within our department. And, and if I can just add briefly to that, it's all about perception. It's, it's all about perception. When, when I'm talking to young people and we start talking about careers. We start talking about, I specifically mentioned law enforcement because of what's been going on over the last several months. I wanted them to be able to talk about that and understand that you have a future. And um, my mom reminds me of this now more than before, but you have less years ahead of you than you do behind you when you get to a certain age. And these kids have to understand that it is gonna require your input. And it's, you can start right now. I'm talking to children as, as young as 13 years old. And I need them to know exactly what you said. And so it's, it's easier for me to say it. It's something else for, for it to be backed up when I introduce them to it. And that's what the role, I think, is outward of me. 
Thank you. Well, we're at approximately the hour mark, and so we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in approximately five minutes. I will say to any anybody that's watching and you have a question that you feel like you want someone on this panel to, to answer, please email us at events at ncdps.gov. That's events at ncdps.gov. You may also um, find on our website a way to log in and you can answer, ask your question virtually. We'll take a, about a five minute break and we'll be right back.
Okay, thank you for coming back with us, for those that are, have rejoined the forum, and we're going to get right, right back to it. Uh, so one of the questions that, that um, has come up quite, a, quite often with um, the racial justice and racial inequities um, task force and those committees has to do with SROs. Major Peterson, I'm going to put you on the spot. Talk to me a little bit about SROs and, and how do you feel they are helpful or not in the community, in a school setting? Okay, we, we have SROs in all of the high schools, the middle schools, and the majority of the elementary schools. And they seem to be working very well. It's a very good program. They interact with the students. They, on a, a weekly basis, teach a class letting them know what law enforcement is all about now they are they are in schools um, for um, crimes being committed in the schools okay but like chief kelly said we have a diversionary program that depending on what the crime is we try to um, use that program to help that student because we don't want to cause students to get criminal records because once they get a criminal record, their career is pretty much over um, in some jobs, in certain jobs. So the program itself has been very valuable to the sheriff's office to be able to interact with the students, to let them know what law enforcement is really all about, um, that we're not always out there running and gunning and um, arresting people. So um, I recommend it. Okay. Chief Kelly? Quickly to that, to Major Peterson's point the, of the importance, as a, as a federal police officer, I'm jealous that we don't have SROs because Major Peterson made a point is that he has an opportunity and we do too in downtime, whenever that is. But he has an advantage as it relates to interacting with kids because he has a deputy in the school, whereas local law enforcement usually doesn't. So it's important because he can become a mentor. Um, and the kid don't even know he's being mentored by the deputy sheriff um, to build that relationship and understanding and, and get a, bit, a better picture of what a... Uh, police officer or deputy sheriff is unfortunately there's also been in the news media at times there's been reports of situations where some people felt like maybe someone in that school resource officer role might have been a little bit heavy-handed what I, I don't know pastor Rowden or or dr. Davis or or mr. books have have you heard anything like that do you hear from parents or or young kids that that have an issue with the person that is in their school? I just think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's a circumstantial um, basis. Again, perception. If we see, like you may have witnessed, a video of an SRO officer, he could be in Atlanta, Georgia, and does something, and those kids see that on social media, and they come back to school the next day, then... Um, he may, or somebody that from the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department may have to deal with that issue. So what does he do? What, what does, it, does that responsibility fall on the SRO officer here in Fayetteville, North Carolina? In some ways, yes, it does. And just like when a child is killed tragically outside of a school, um, we send people inside of the school to deal with grief counseling and all those types of things. If that's something that the SRO officer here in Cumberland County has to do, then I don't see why it should not stop him from doing it. Pastor? Yes, I was going to say, based on the question about SRO, and of course with uh, Chief Kelly, he was, uh, said he was jealous about not having that opportunity, but we do recall when there was a time when we had 
a program. I was fortunate enough to work as the community liaison in Cumberland County Schools it's for Central Services, and they had a program called Every Minute Count when there was a police officer assigned uh, that officer and I would go to homes, you know, reference truancy, and it gave Fayetteville Police Office a great opportunity to interact not just with the kid but with the families, and I saw great results that came from that. Uh, so, again, the interaction with the, the kids and the family I think is vital and maybe not necessarily having something like that now, but that same kind of interaction, it did well. I witnessed on many occasions, we would go over to 450 homes in a year uh, interacting with families and I could see a difference. In fact, that was one time, it was, it was a write-up in Fayetteville Observer, a mother uh, who was anti-law enforcement, if you would, uh, because of death of one of her family members, you know, that was killed in the officer involved shooting. But after myself and this law enforcement officer would interact at her home, she said that she had a whole different view. You said it a while ago, Mr. Brooks, is perception. You know, when we can get in the community, and that's why I said earlier, it's important for law enforcement to be actively in the community to make an impact on a young colonel, future colonel, uh, in their life in the community. Okay. Sure. And the SROs, they don't just stop at the end of the school year. The Cumberland County Sheriff's Office puts on a summer camp. We didn't do it this year, of course, because of COVID, but we do yearly a summer camp for these kids where the SROs continue to work with anywhere between 85 to 100 kids at various locations where they take them throughout the week to do different activities just to let them know that they're human as well. All right. I believe we do have a question. If First Sergeant Baker, if you want to so the first question is coming from Freddie Barnes, and he asked the entire panel, what is law enforcement doing differently in this BLM environment? Also, how are your agencies dealing with the issue of bias regarding the hiring of racial and gender ethnicities? I'll take that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barnes, for your question. Um, you know, law enforcement, not just here in North Carolina, but all throughout the country, we're having conversations about how can we be better? We all are reviewing our use of force policies. We all have mandated numerous types of training, a, a duty and responsibility to intervene, a duty and responsibility to take a, re to take a complaint and, and to make sure that we act on it and to be responsive as we possibly can. But one of the great things here in North Carolina, you know, I mentioned earlier talking about transparency. I'll also talk about the importance of accountability. And here in law enforcement, here in our great state, we all take an oath of office if you are a law enforcement officer. Our power arrives from the very people that we serve. They are the jurors that sit in all of our court cases, and they are responsible for giving all of us our power. With regard to accountability from the two chiefs associations, the sheriff's association, you know, working with the patrol, I get to work with these great leaders day in and day out. And I know that they all believe in holding our, our folks and their folks accountable. We also have an excellent working relationship with our conference of district attorneys. We're in partnership with all of them. And then I'm honored that we have Director Schurmeyer here present. With the patrol and these other agencies, when we have an officer involved shooting, we don't investigate ourselves. We contact the State Bureau of Investigation. They come in and they conduct an investigation, which is criminal. When we do our internal investigation, it's administrative. So our personnel are being held to two standards when they're involved in an incident that does harm and may have resulted in a loss of life. So we're very proactive. Um, this current movement gives us an opportunity, Mr. Barnes, to look at how it is we do our job, how we police, and the goal is to ultimately be better. This task force presents a way for us to do just that. 
to have open and honest conversations, to share best practices, to take that information and, and to grow and to be better. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in as well. And thanks, Colonel. Um, it, we, we mentioned previously about the Center for the Reduction of Law Enforcement Use of Force. And, and I'll read just the very beginning uh, part of the mission statement and then ca encapsulize the four objectives. But the, but the mission statement says up front, the SBI Center exists to proactively develop, advocate, and support the implementation of evidence-based measures to reduce law enforcement use of force, and in doing so, to enhance the safety of both the members of the general public and law enforcement officers. The objectives are real clear. Number one, collect data conduct behavioral and situational analysis, and produce applied research on the precursors and outcomes of law enforcement use of force. Number two, promote training for law enforcement officers that will reduce the potential use of force within North Carolina and assure the mutual safety and well-being of members of the public and law enforcement. Number three, we've talked about this before, promote transparency, mutual understanding, and public engagement related to law enforcement use of force. And uh, the last one, pursue collaborations and partnerships with law enforcement partners, higher education institutions, and community organizations. So um, I'd, I'd say that um, what, one of the critical things involving use of force is data. Do you have good data? Uh, and is it standardized? And right now across North Carolina, we don't have standardized reporting. We don't have a uniform way of, of r reporting the use of force. So um, what we've talked about, and I don't want to jump ahead of the work of the center, but what we've talked about is uh, standardizing uh, the reporting of use of force and collecting that data so that we can have accurate data, and then creating perhaps a public dashboard where the community can go on there and begin to study use of force across the state or within their community. So that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Yes, Chief Kelly. Yes, you know, law enforcement agencies, particularly ours, do a lot of bias training, um, racial intelligence training. Um, but I think it's important that, so this panel is, is pretty much comprised of law enforcement. We have higher education and religious but we we don't have a conversation because it's all inclusive as it relates to bias but law enforcement finds itself having to answer these questions whereas bias bias is all over society you know but we need to have the conversation to where where is the bias in the educational system where is the bias in the economic system where is the bias in the mental health system? You know, law enforcement is willing to have the conversation about bias and understand that there is bias within its ranks. But this needs to be a community-wide conversation because a lot of the problems that law enforcement deals with started a long time ago as it relates to someone's life and where they may have been derailed based on a bias. So they don't have the same economic opportunities, educational opportunities that someone else may have, and they end up in the law enforcement system. But we all, as a society, has to talk about biases. The community has to talk about biases as it relates their biases against law enforcement. So we have to have, we have, the, the communication now has to go from Law enforcement recognizing that we have issues. We have issues, right? But then now everybody else has to understand and recognize that we have issues. Now, how do we fix those issues? So we can have bias training all day long, but if, but if the collective parties don't come together and acknowledge their biases, you're just going to have a one-sided conversation. The part that I would add to that is... Um, there was the acronym mentioned in the question um, was BLM. So we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. Some people call it a protest. Some people call it a riot. Again, which is indeed pointing out our, how we view certain things when we hear certain words merged together or when we see something on TV or on video or witness it in our own personal experiences. 
We can sum that up in the word value. We're talking about value. Do I value my life? Do you value your life? Do we value our lives the same? Do we value law enforcement life? Do we value the life that the law enforcement has to live in order to function in their job? Do, does law enforcement um, have enough information to, to be aware of what it looks like when somebody's walking down the street and judging them based off of what they have on versus where they're coming from versus how fast they're walking, if they're jogging, if they're walking with a group of people, if they're walking with their girlfriend, what time of day it is, all those things. So I agree with you, um, Assistant Chief Kelly, about the biases. And everybody needs to find some sort of way to reckon with their biases, reconcile with their biases. Again, going back to a word that was used earlier. But when we have spent so many months watching protests and so many answers and so many um, ideas that are being thrown and tossed around all across this country about what we should do and what we should take into account to not only address the issues that we have across the board with law enforcement in our communities, but how do we fix this? And we talk about it all the time about just how broad that problem is from judges all the way down to recruits to be law enforcement. So there has to be a sort of accountability that people can believe in, some sort of accountability that people can trust. And not only that, something that we can also invest in by being a part of that solution, by getting more people to be a part of that solution. Taking the role that I've taken to address and work with and talk to the police has not always been favorable by my immediate community. But my fear and my concern is if I do not do that. So we need more people to feel that way, and the people need to feel that the law enforcement will in turn uh, reciprocate whatever efforts we put out from the community to set, show that the value is such that black lives matter. Dr. Davis, I was going to come to you next. Oh. I was going to ask you about what are your stu students saying about that, and what, what advice do you give them when they talk about this topic? Okay, um, there's a lot to be said when we talk about implicit bias. And I see you laughing, but there's a lot to be said. And in fact, um, I'm going to step out and say that implicit bias is really just the new word to discuss this issue of systemic racism. And it goes beyond law enforcement. When we talk about the criminal justice system, we're including law enforcement, courts, and corrections. And unfortunately, our young people are and have been impacted heavily in those areas as far as the criminal justice system. And some of it is a not some of it, but research has shown that implicit bias is real. And when we talk about implicit bias, we're talking about unconscious biasness. And each and every one of us on the panel this morning, we can say we have no biases. But I'm sure Chief Kelly may be familiar with the uh, IAT survey and, survey and others as well. Um, survey similar. You take those surveys and you find out that you do have some biases, and those unconscious biases do impact how you interact with citizens, how law enforcement um, officers interact with those individuals they may come into contact with. And just like Mr. Brooks mentioned earlier, it may be because of how they, they appear, how they dress, just a, a lack of understanding of an individual. Um, and I know you asked one question very quickly. For an example, many years ago, um, I worked in the, in the field myself for 15 years prior to um, becoming involved with um, higher ed. Uh, I served as a probation officer, uh, and, and I also served as a criminal justice planner that really looked at issues in society and looked at um, what are the problems we're facing and tried to develop solutions for that. And what I want to say, even as a, a young person at that time, I was 21 years old, um, beginning to work in the system, and even I was told, before you interview for this position, you need to make sure that you change your, the look because you appear to be a threat. You have natural hair, you are of a darker skin tone, you are female, et cetera. And these are the things, unfortunately, 20 years later, these are the things that our students, um, that I'm hearing from our students in regards to some of the biases that they face. So are they experiencing them? Yes. Today? Yes. 
what can we do about it? We've had to move beyond the conversation. Um, Chief talked about training, and we can train and train and train. But what do you do with training? When you start a new job, what do you have? You have a certificate of training. We may forget what we've learned. So on top of training, it requires some reinforcement, some supervision. So, and I see the 30 seconds, but with supervision, then we're able to identify. Then what do you do when you see that behavior? Because with supervision, you're looking for that specific behavior. So am I hearing that from students? Do students talk about that? Yes. Sorry, I, I don't see where I can add this in here, so I'll qu add it quickly. So one of the things that I think law enforcement needs to do a better job at is that as it relates to their efforts to interact with, with, with children or the citizens. So we have a tendency to identify problem children, right? So when we identify with problem children, we're exposing our officers, let's just say the worst of the worst. We never expose our officers to the good kids. We, we leave them out. We have programs and, and camps, I'm just gonna say it, for bad kids. But, what's, but we're, we're showing our officers that a certain demographic is bad all day long. So we need to do it better to introduce ourselves and society can do a better job introducing us to the good ones. So those interactions will help law enforcement officers see another side of who we deal with on a daily basis. Can I take you to very quickly? Sure. Not after the fact. Absolutely. Not after, early on. Uh, and I believe there's a, a positive to that, not necessarily negative, but not exposing them to the good thing, you know, and I'm not preaching, Colonel. Jesus said, you know, that those who are not sick don't need a doctor. The ones that are sick are the ones in need of a doctor, and I'm paraphrasing. So I believe just me having worked in the school system for years and being in the community that, yes, those programs for what we say are the troubled kids is much needed. But in essence, we do do things for the good kids. I see other programs when you go in the community and doing different things. Uh, um, adopt a cop, I mean, uh, the kids in the school system. So I believe it's it's still a positive thing and not necessarily bad. I'm not sure if that's how you meant it, that, you know, why aren't we doing anything for, for the good kids? I, I think we do, but maybe not as on the level that we do for those who need uh, attention more. And Chief Kelly, you, you said something that sparked a question for me. How do you think that's impacted how your officers interact with the public? Well, I can only go by 26 years of experience in law enforcement and the fact that it's negative. I believe if, I don't have time to give you analogies that I always use, but if you always show someone something bad, they will believe that's bad. Um, and I think, so I'll give you an example. Went to a, a, um, a homicide a few years ago. It was five people shot, three dead, one wounded hiding behind the house with two people hiding them. One went to the hospital. So I'm the, I'm, I'm the highest ranking person there at the time. And I'm the only minority officer there at the time. And I could see everybody looking at me like, what's wrong with your people? So, but that's all they see. So I think, yeah, I think to your question, I think it impacts uh, officers negatively if you only see negative parts of society. Major Peterson, can you add to that? How do you think that, that what's going on in the community and across the country today, do you think that's had an impact on how your, your deputies interact with the public? Well, it, it does. And just like the chief said and like everyone else has said, um, we need to train, but we have to have more than just training. Like the doctor said, we have to do reinforcement on that. And it does impact them if you're exposed to bad all the time. And, and basically, that's what law enforcement is exposed to, bad all the time. You don't need us for the good people. 
we deal with people that society do not want to deal with. And so it, it does make people, make officers think a certain way. And they begin to think that all of them are bad. They'll look at a community and say the entire community is bad, and it's not. It's not. And so with training and reinforcement, talking, panels like this, that's the only way we're going to be able to change it. Colonel, do you have anything to add to that when your troopers stop someone on the freeway? Um, the, that unknown of, of the person in the vehicle, have you seen a change? Have some of your younger troopers come to you and said, I'm not sure I can continue doing this? Well, you know, it is a difficult, very, very difficult time to be in the law enforcement profession. But I cannot think of, just like Mr. Secretary said earlier, of a more noble profession than to serve your fellow man and woman. You know, I view all of our state troopers as being ambassadors. You know, we represent our state, we wear our flag, and we're proud to be North Carolina state troopers. We just graduated 23 state troopers last Friday. And this school, everything that they had to go through with COVID-19, an exposure and an outbreak and, you know, all the precautions that they had to go through and, you know, their school was prolonged by six weeks, but they made it. They d went through all of that just to, and, and while they were going through this last seven months, all the protest and all the civil unrest that they had the opportunity to witness. But I'm just so grateful that we have people that still believe in the power of serving their fellow man and woman. And so, you know, we have an awesome mission. It's a noble profession. And, you know, I'm thankful for the men and women who get up every single day that are state troopers trying to make a difference here in North Carolina. across the dirt road from my grandmother. And my mom has nine sisters and only four brothers. So for some reason, God has dominated my life around a bunch of women. <laughs> so I've learned to be careful. <laughs> and uh, my oldest daughter, who's my twin, when the protest started here in Fayetteville, uh, she made her signs without consulting me, and she went. Um, to watch the protest, from her words. And I said, well, if you're watching the protest, then put your sign down. Because you're not standing in a position where people can see what you're saying. If you'd rather be in a position where people can see what you're saying, you represent you. Because if you go through that crowd, you'd be hard pressed to find someone that thinks exactly like you, looks exactly like you, operates exactly like you. There's a lot of diversity with what's going on right now in the Black Lives Matter movement. As you can see now, you have maybe half the people out there are actually black. So yes, I encourage them to be involved in the extent of understanding why you're there. And every um, ounce of your word protest does not mean physically having to be in the street. But I would not stop my children from being involved um, nobody stopped me. As a matter of fact, nobody encouraged me when I was younger to be involved. And I've been involved like this ever since I can remember, maybe not in the same capacity. And that's why I try to tell people that there's no perfection. There's nothing better than you can do to pay attention to what's going on and have a voice. So the only thing that's gonna, that's gonna be perfect with what you're doing is your effort. And of course, I have a 18 year old who's now in college. Um, Fortunately, she's at an HBCU, and she'll get to see a different side of black life that she might not have seen in my own home. So there's diversity even in the communities that we're trying to diversify in. And with young people, the more you talk to them, the more you see that. So this um, Black Lives Matter movement and the whole entire process that we're trying to get to be a more open process is not even 
cookie. You can't just put it one side over here and one side over there. It's, it's way different now. And another thing that America, United States needs to understand within itself is that you have a whole entire demographic of generation coming up behind you. You're not gonna be able to look at things and look at it as so much as black and white or black, white, and brown for that matter. So um, we need to get this problem and these problems addressed and f fix as much as we can now because there's a whole other generation coming up behind us and we're not exactly sure what that's gonna look like. Okay. Anybody have anything to add? Pastor Rowden, your, your young parishioners, do they come to you and look for answers? And not just the parishioners, but young people in, in the community. And I agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Brooks about the generation that's coming up. Sometimes we uh, get tunnel vision and we're focusing on just what's in front of us, but not realizing the biggest problem that we have in America right now is a generational issue. And it's not going to change if we do not address generation generational issues so yeah we talk about uh, freedom of speech and I find myself explaining to young people freedom of speech don't mean you just say anything you want to say uh, you have to be careful because it identifies you and who you are maybe not in the right way like you said that sign your daughter's holding up all they see is that sign they don't know the words or the feelings behind that sign. So I, I believe our, our youth are very important and faith-based can have a positive impact with youth program. And I think law enforcement, because I don't know of a program that law enforcement here in Fayetteville have that they don't include faith-based. And we've been doing this long before, you know, COVID, long before, you know, uh, the shootings and all, you know, so we're grateful to faith uh, base and the partnership we have with law enforcement here in Cumberland County. Okay. My next question has to do with, with oversight of uh, law enforcement agencies. And I, I want to ask the, the panel, what do you think about, or when do you think it's most appropriate for an outside entity to come in and, and either be a part of the policy making or, or is it just after an event? When do you think it's um, oversight is needed? I'm, I, I, I think, I wanna say immediately, but not with anybody and not with everybody. But law enforcement is the community. I think um, Colonel McNeil spoke about that earlier. You know, all of the sheriffs live in the community or they live in the county or they live somewhere near it. We all have neighbors. So it, the whole thing of police looking, looking like a totally different type of alienated peer, people and the community looking like it, I think that gap needs to decrease some. And I think that is what you mentioned about transparency. Um, uh, my idea of transparency may not be what somebody else's idea of transparency is. It's specifically in law enforcement. You have a job to do. At the end of the day, it's a job for everybody that's that's in law enforcement. So I don't know everything that goes along with um, um, Assistant Chief Kelly's job. I don't even know what goes on every day in Dr. Davis's job. But if this one incident is what's bringing us together, I think there's a sort of transparency that needs to happen in that kind of an immediate because of what we've seen over the last seven months, if not over the last 45, 50 years. Any any of our law enforcement folks want to talk about outside oversight? So we talk about outside oversight, that's, that's, a, that's a whole different dynamic. Um, in law enforcement, I don't think any agency head is in a, opposed to outside um, intervention, so to speak, like Mr. Brooks said, but it ha can't be any and everybody. But let's take it a step, let's say backwards a little bit, is that we have a tendency and everywhere, uh, we had a command staff meeting a few weeks ago, we were talking about what our officers need or want um, as it relates to retention. And I just stopped and looked around the room and a bunch of old people talking. We're making decisions um, for our future leaders and our officers, but they're not in the conversation. So I think we talk about oversight, and we, we're probably talking about as it relates to use of force and things of that nature. And but I, I want to take it a step backwards. Let's just say, and say let's ask 
to citizens or society, what do you want out of law enforcement? You know, we assume we know what you want. But you tell us what you want and what you want us to be. So that's how I see uh, uh, intervention, outside intervention, is that tell us what kind of law enforcement agency you want, what's important to you, what's your priority, what's not your priority. And then you will have, uh, like Mr. Brooks said, perception. Perception is reality, is that you're doing what I want you to do. Okay. Director Shermeyer? Thanks. We... Um I, I, and, and I agree with the panel here. I think that uh, oftentimes it has to be community-based. And um, as you mentioned, it's, uh, you have to be careful here. Um, you know, I've seen uh, occasions where uh, people uh, chair boards that call police murderers behind the badge. And, uh, and they're actually in a decision-making role. Uh, when that happens, what confidence can the police have that the community's supporting them? So um, I think it has to be community-based. I think it promotes transparency and accountability and uh, ad addresses a lot of issues. But uh, we have to be very, very careful that you don't bring in people that have uh, a very biased ag agenda themselves. Okay. Well, I think we're getting close um, to the to the end of time and I want to give everybody an opportunity in case there's something that we haven't talked about that's um, that you want to make sure that we um, add to the conversation and actions that are taken so um, I'll, I'll give each of you um, just a, a, about a minute if you will um, if there's something that you just want to make sure that you say before we go um, Dr. Davis I'm just going to take this opportunity to somewhat um, continue responding to the previous question in regards to oversight, because I think that's very important. And when we talk about oversight, I think we need to be mindful that we're not talking about an effort that is necessarily reactive, because when we talk about intervention, I kind of hear reactive. Uh, so on oversight, yes, bringing in and being careful of who those, uh, who that. Um, entity is in regards to the oversight, but even if we're looking at including other um, entities as, such as um, community members outside of the councilmen, outside of the clergy, outside of law enforcement, but those um, individuals that are really uh, familiar and understand some of the issues and needs of the community. So with the oversight, um, in my response, I would say that is something that is needed, not necessarily as a reprimand, but something that exists there, and not just at, in, in a reactive nature for intervention, but prior to um, an issue that we see happening. And some of the issues that we see, some of the things we face today, unfortunately, we know that the media ha may sensationalize the issue. So that's what the public is seeing but it's still there, it's still real, it still exists. And I think that is something that will be helpful. In addition to continuing this conversation beyond just exchanging ideas and talking about it, but moving forward with action and implementation with deliberate dialogue. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Brooks? I'm gonna keep it to a minute. <laughs> I'm gonna keep it to a minute, but in, in just, I. I think it's important that we understand um, from the community side, I'm gonna speak from the community side, and I've heard this before, change your attitude, you change your altitude. I think the my community needs to have, when I say my community, I don't just mean the black community, I mean the community that I that I deal with, that I work with, and I'm, it's various. But I think we need to change our attitude towards what law enforcement is and try to move to what we want it to be and what capacity we have to make that happen. Um, it's okay to disagree. Um, I've, I've got my past of um, run-ins with law enforcement. Um, ironically, the nicest law enforcement I ever run into was a state trooper. So, um, <laughs> I mean, it, not to toot your horn, but it's just, a, it's just a fact. It's just a fact, and I was younger, um, and at the time I was going through different things with other types of law enforcement. Not that I was a criminal, but I was, going through experiences with other types of law enforcement, and then when I had an experience with a state trooper, it was just totally different. So you take those experiences and you take into account for what they are. 
But in just and and summing it up, I just want people to understand that disagreement does not mean that we disengage. We do not allow law enforcement to exist without our input. We do not allow law enforcement to exist without having some say so. And we do not allow law enforcement to exist without asking for what you said, accountability, what we want to see, and that will require our involvement. And um, that's that's pretty much all I have to say. Okay, Colonel McNeil. Thank you again, ma'am. One of the just quick highlights that I'd like to just bring to everybody's attention, you know, here in North Carolina, you know, we have a, a criminal justice commission that serves, if you will, as an outside panel that holds all law enforcement here in North Carolina to very high standards. And when oaths of office are ever violated, that outside entity is responsible for holding people accountable with regard to their certification. And so I just wanted to share that. And then most of the law enforcement agencies that are represented here are also accredited. And with that accreditation, we have uh, numerous high standards that we all have to meet in order to maintain that. One of those standards is having a mechanism in place to be able to file complaints. You know, with the State Highway Patrol, you know, through telephone, walking up to a state trooper, um, uh, calling in, doing it uh, anonymously by email through uh, a DPS hotline. There are numerous ways for our organization to be able to, to receive feedback, good, bad, uh, and indifferent. And so I just wanted to make those just two points of clarification and just share that information. Uh, but lastly, I'm most grateful for the invitation to be here, to be able to share just a little bit about my organization. And it's just an honor and a privilege to be here with my colleagues. Thank you. Okay. Chief Kelly. Yes, uh, Secretary Hooks, I need you to take Colonel McNeil back with you because he come to Fayetteville to try to recruit. We are also <laughs> hiring. And you don't have to leave Fayetteville or come to county. So I'll put, I'll, I'll put that out there. He thought he going to get away with that. But I, I want to I wanna be clear that this is good conversation and good dialogue but I, I think it's highly important and I'm no genius that I think we bring all entities to the table I think as we should we're holding law enforcement accountable but we're not holding everybody else accountable we're not holding other parts of our society accountable I won't name them you know you know what they are but but you have to, as citizens who vote and pay taxes, have to demand more from your public servants. So, so have everybody to the table, acknowledge their faults and what they can do better, and you demand that. Um, the, the local child advocacy center has a uh, child fatality review board. When a child unfortunately dies, if a child drowns, it go all parts of society is represented. So each part of that board tells what they could have done better as a result of that child's death. So it's putting your feelings on that table. The school system says what they could have done better or what their interactions were, law enforcement, uh, um, um, mental health, social services. All those folks take account of what they could have done better to have prevented that child dying from an unfortunate drowning, just just say. So I think we do the same thing as it relates to this thing we call bias, is that before, like Major Peterson said, before we get caught, because nobody's inviting us to the six-year-old six birthday party to eat ice cream and cake, um, before they come into our interactions negatively, let's correct each step that a person or persons go through so, so that they don't become entangled in our criminal justice system, and we can fix this as a holistic approach. Thank you. Okay. Pastor Rowden? I would like to just close out by saying to those who are watching or who may be listening or watch or listen later on, that in order for us uh, as a community to build the partnership and more so the trust between the community and law enforcement, is that we ourselves have to be more engaged. We ourselves have to make sure that we are trusted by the ones we are trying to get to trust someone else. Because if me as a pastor in the faith-based community, if the community don't trust me and I'm trying to get them to trust something else, it's for naught. And I'm not just saying with faith-based, but whoever we are, 
whatever capacity we are in in our community that we need to be engaged and involved because I see a lot of people when something happens, that's the only time they get engaged and don't have all the information. So please, ma'am, please, sir, who's watching and listening, be engaged and uh, gain the trust from your community yourself. Thank you. Okay. Major Peterson. Thank you. And I'm really honored to be here today. Um, we don't want all of our people to go to highway patrol. So we are hiring also, um, or to the city. <laughs> we, we do have openings. So you don't have to go there. When you know better, you do better. And I think that when we have panels like this to educate us and to discuss things, we have to go out and make the change. We have to do better. And I'm committed to doing better, to do the things that I can to make this community make my community a better place and like the colonel said we too have um avenues to report things to um to the sheriff you can call the sheriff directly you can email the coming county sheriff's office or you can just stop a deputy on the road and he will communicate with you and take your complaint so if you have any problems we're here to help you get through them and thank you again for allowing me to be here. Okay. And Director Shermeyer. Congratulations to the panelists. What a what a great experience. I I wrote a, a letter to the editor that I was surprised to get published, and uh, I titled it, We Will Do Better for Those We Serve. And I'll just read a couple of excerpts. Without question, what we saw occur with the death of Mr. George Floyd goes against every tenet of impartial justice and the very foundations of the law enforcement profession itself. This act was indefensible and criminal and does a great disservice to the many honorable and dedicated law enforcement professionals who serve our state and our nation and its many diverse communities. This is not representative of who we are and what we stand for. But we also must plainly acknowledge that this is not about a single incident in Minneapolis, no matter how tragic and how great a miscarriage of justice this act was. But rather, this is emblematic of a much larger and systemic issue of mistrust, misunderstanding, and fear by many people of color with respect to the very law enforcement professionals who are sworn to protect and serve them as a profession we must come to grips with this, and it must be addressed with the greatest urgency. This cannot continue. Collectively, law enforcement professionals and leaders must seek new and better ways to understand the root causes of use of force incidents and to better equip our law enforcement officers to de-escalate difficult situations and to employ minimum use of force to the greatest extent possible while preserving their own personal safety. This is not always an easy task in sometimes volatile and dangerous circumstances, but is it incumbent on law enforcement professionals to continuously strive to do better for the citizens we serve, all of our citizens. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And Mr. Secretary, if you will, close us out. Thank you, Director Walker. Thank you to all our panelists who have joined together today, and thank you all who have tuned in virtually. This has been a tremendous experience uh, for all of us here, and I hope for all of, us, all of those who watched. I listened intently, and I was reflecting as I was sitting there. There are a couple of things that kind of resonate with me each and every day, being the Secretary of the Department of Public Safety and the Homeland Security Advisor for North Carolina. One, how do I go about every day to try to protect and create a better environment for 10.4 million people in North Carolina? And secondly, how do I obtain wisdom in doing that? I often lean toward Proverbs seeking that wisdom. So pastor, keep praying for me, keep praying for us. And often I find that the wisdom is just coming together, not just for conversation, but deep collaboration. Again, we may not agree on every point, but the mission that we have, both as public servants and citizens in every community across North Carolina, requires us to do what's right for each and every person
that we may touch. And so I'm humbled to be part of the noble profession of public safety. I'm humbled to be a part of various communities. And I'm honored to be a black man in North Carolina. No doubt, troubles and tribulation will come our way. But I know who I am and whose I am. And I try to impart that on every young person that I touch. And I want to encourage each one of you, never get weary on this long journey. I described it as a long journey, but as I said at the beginning, just like the arc that described by Dr. King, it bends toward justice. Thank you. All right. Thank you again. Thank you for being here, all our panelists, and thank you for watching. And again, if anybody still has questions that were not answered here today, please, we'll continue to monitor the website, events at ncdps.gov. That's events at ncdps.gov, and please send in your questions or your suggestions, and we'll make sure that they get to the right people. Thank you.